Our Major Garrett joins us now from the White House. So, Major, we heard in the piece calls for Susan Rice to testify under oath. They are growing on Capitol Hill. So does that seem likely at this point? It does appear likely, but for the intelligence committees on the House and Senate side, there are lots of potential witnesses. Almost every week, it seems, this story creates a new storyline where a witness could be called to testify. Last week, it was Michael Flynn. Would there be immunity for the former national security advisor for the Trump White House? Now it's Susan Rice, national security advisor for President Obama. Will she be called to testify? It appears... By all evidence available now that what Susan Rice did was perfectly within her legal rights as national security advisor, that is to say, to find out the identities of U.S. persons caught up, incidentally, in this surveillance. What she did with that is a bit less clear and might be the subject either the Senate Intelligence Committee or the House Intelligence Committee would want to pursue through her testimony, and that's yet to be decided. So meanwhile, uh, you've been following another twist surrounding uh, the Russia investigation, and this one involves another former Trump advisor, Carter Page. What can you tell us about that? I would describe it less of a twist as an evolution. Carter Page was someone whose name cropped up during the campaign as someone who was a foreign policy advisor to the Trump for president campaign, identified as such by the candidate himself. But then when it became clear that Carter Page had some activity or some engagement with Russian operatives, the Trump campaign pretended they knew nothing about him, that he never existed as an advisor on foreign policy to that campaign. Well, now Carter Page's name keeps cropping up. This is the evolution part I'm talking about. It's now been confirmed by CBS News that way back in 2013, Russian spies approached Carter Page trying to recruit him or get him to be sympathetic to their cause, whatever it was. Now, that's long before Carter Page became a foreign policy advisor, though that was a short-lived term of foreign policy advisement to the Trump campaign. But nevertheless, this is enlarging the body of knowledge about Carter Page's interactions with Russians and the fact that he was at one time a foreign policy advisor to the Trump campaign, Trump campaign cannot be denied. He is now part of the FBI investigation into Russian interference in the 2016 election and remains an interesting figure. Major, let's turn now to foreign policy, beginning with the White House's response to that alleged chemical attack in Syria in which it cast blame on the Obama administration. Now, that's certainly their prerogative, but while the White House plays the blame game, is it saying anything about a possible shift in policy when it comes to Syria? Well, prerogative is one term for it, but many in the foreign policy community seem to believe that that was the worst possible time to cast dispersions, politically or otherwise, on the Obama administration, because this is a new chemical attack with fresh victims. It appears to have been generated, ordered, and carried out by the Assad regime. And there's an important intervening, or possibly important intervening, factor. Last week, the Secretary of State, Rex Tillerson, and the U.N. Ambassador, representing the United States, Nikki Haley, both said, in various ways, that the future of the Assad regime in Syria was up to Syrians, that it was no longer the policy of the American government that Bashir al-Assad had to go. The dictator of Syria had lost his legitimacy and had to be removed from power, either through negotiation, the preferred approach of the Obama administration, or by some other means. And so when this administration says the Assad regime and its future is no longer a topic for the international community, but strictly one for Syrians, that might have been interpreted by the Assad regime as giving it more latitude to carry out its punishing military actions within the context of the long-running civil war. And this chemical weapons attack may be the latest and most grisly manifestation of that extra room to maneuver. No one knows that for sure, but you have to take these two events at least in some context. And so for the Trump White House to blame this attack on the inaction of the Obama administration conveniently ignores what has happened in the last week and what many in the foreign policy community argue have to be seen as related. Uh, Major, before you go, we want to shift a little bit to domestic policy and ask you a little bit about health care. Vice President Mike Pence made his second trip in as many nights to discuss a revived push on an Obamacare replacement with the House Republicans. So clearly, health care is not dead. It's a little on life support. Certainly, the doctors play, paying very close attention to it to extend this metaphor <laughs> far beyond uh, where it should be extended. But give me an idea. You know, where do you think uh, things are headed? 
Let's go back to metaphors and politics because uh, they are convenient and in this case applicable. It is very clear to House Republicans that they would be in sorry shape going home to their congressional districts for the Easter recess, which begins this Thursday or Friday, and be able to tell their constituents positively nothing about the replacement of the Obamacare law because it failed two weeks ago. They have to show some activity, some level of engagement with the Trump White House to keep this process at least moving. And so that's what was undertaken this week. A lot of meetings, no resolution, no legislative language to have the Congressional Budget Office score, no bills coming to the floor, but at least there are meetings. So they can go back to their constituents and say, hey, look, this isn't over. We're trying again. We're working it out. We haven't given up on this because the worst place most Republicans could find themselves going back home to town halls is saying we've accomplished nothing, we've done nothing, and there's nothing on the horizon. The problem with this uh, short-term tactical strategy is when Congress comes back from its two-week Easter break, it's going to be up against a one-week deadline to keep the government open because funding for every budget aspect of the United States government expires at the end of month of April. And that's going to be Congress's principal focus the week it comes back. It's not going to be repealing and replacing the Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as Obamacare. It's going to be keeping the government open. Once that hurdle is crossed, then these talks can resume on health care. But though there was activity this week, nothing is going to be resolved for at least two or three weeks. So what you have is activity generating some political cover, but no actual action. Hmm. Major Garrett at the White House. Thank you so much, Major. Sure. You got it.